just uh, we are just going to start the uh, keynote address of Christina Adams. Uh, but but at the same time, I would like to inform to participants that because uh, there is some delay in the uh, program schedule of inaugural session, so quiz session is still going on. You can uh, um, uh, submit it up to nine fifty five. So now, before I invite. Christina Adams for the for their uh, valuable thoughts, thinking, work done on camel and related aspect. I would like to say a few words about the Christina Adam. She is the author of Camel Crazy, a quest for miracles in the mysterious words of camel camels, which won a. Natulius Book Award and a Real Boy, a true story of autism, early intervention and recovery. I would like to emphasize that her research work is not only related with the lab, but she has converted whole of his vicinity into a lab where uh, she is not only experimenting but she is also surveying and elaborating the things. her work has been appreciated in la times washington post which are considered one of the best uh, uh, selling newspapers npr ochibai orange coast magazine ravishly open democracy global advances in health and medicine the anthology heroics women's experience in the pandemic literary magazines and many more she has been featured by CBS San Diego NPR the public library of science DNA blog Dubai one Gulf news Khalees times and many others more interesting is that she has an MFA in creative writing and she is the winner of Dr V Korean award of excellence in dairy farming practices and innovation and a lifetime achievement award from the shri ram singh memorial animal welfare and this is also very nice to notice that she is uh, also associated uh, with the indian community and working a lot on camel studies basically she is a camel researcher author journalist and what not today she is going to enlighten us on a global perspective on pastoralist value to biodiversity uh, not taking too much time i request christina adams to please deliver your keynote address christina and please thank you very very much i hope that everyone can hear me are we is our audio good yes perfect thank you So I would really like to uh extend my gratitude for being included in this amazing consortium of talent and intellect um here at the Dungar College today. Uh it's tonight for me and it's tomorrow morning uh your morning for you. And my uh wonderful um gratitude to you all. Um so Dr. Singh, thank you so much and Dr. Bojack for your coordination. and facilitation uh, dr sahu your your president um your presentation was really really interesting and i've had the pleasure of meeting dr dr agarwal in person so it was wonderful to see him here today and of course abdul shahid who uh, i am going to be so proud to present our joint film project after this discussion so thank you very much and i will start sharing my screen All right. Okay, so uh the title of my uh presentation is A Global Perspective on Pastoralist Value to Biodiversity. And I actually um minimize that. 
Okay, um, it's actually, um, of course, uh, part of this symposium on camel and disease control. And of course, you um, know that we're associated here tonight with Dungar College in Bikaner, Rajasthan, which is an amazing place. I have yet to visit in person, but I have always been very interested in what goes on there. And it is a great honor for me to be here with you today on World Camel Day, June 22nd, 2021. So we're, I would like to start by kind of taking the big picture here. Now, one of the things about being a writer that I have learned, and also I am pretty close to Los Angeles, which of course is like Hollywood and very similar to Bollywood, of course, which you have in your wonderful country of India. Uh, being close to Los Angeles, I have participated in many events there on communication and uh, production and things like that. So one of the things I learned when I was writing about camels and getting close to the point of writing and publishing my new book, Camel Crazy, I was uh, at a conference where it was about science communication. And one of the speakers is a very, very well-known person who has written a lot of television shows that explain medicine and science, and they're very popular here in the United States. And he said, you cannot tell a science story without making it about a story. You need to have a story in it because the vast majority of people aren't really that able to understand science unless it's put in the context of their life or a story. So part of what I do is kind of show why the wonderful things that we are hearing here tonight and that you'll see in my presentation actually why they seem science and sort of niche to science. Nonetheless, they're very important to us all. So therefore, I'm gonna to try to wrap a little bit of this knowledge in a big story about uh, biological diversity and biodiversity and why camels and animals similar uh, to them, to their value in livestock and wildlife as well are so important to our survival. So let's start with the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, we know that many endangered species are surviving in zoos and botanical gardens now, but those are not sustainable to preserve these key ecosystems that have been so much a part of our healthy world, which is now being challenged by all kinds of problems. So these species and ecosystems, they need freedom to evolve in their natural conditions in order to thrive and remain alive, remain sustainable. So economic policies should create financial resources for those who would otherwise damage and exploit those resources. So I think one of the examples could be, you know, our wonderful pastoralists in India are facing all kinds of challenges with maintaining their camels, as we know, and we'll discuss further. So uh, we would like to be able to create financial resources for them so that they don't have to give their camels away, let them go to run wild and cause problems in some villages, or unfortunately, sometimes they are sold for meat um, when we would rather have them here uh, performing their ship of the desert uh, mechanisms, tourism and dairy and other things that we'll talk about in a minute. So that's kind of an example that we're talking about. You have to incentivize the people that maintain these uh, important uh, biodiversity conventions so that they don't end up having to cannibalize them just to survive. So the former United Nations chief uh, Ban Ki-moon says the world is facing multiple crises and that's not a uh, surprise to any of us. He thinks we have about 10 years to act and it is recognized that traditional methods can help sustain biodiverse life. And so in this case, people um, that are indigenous in these populations um, in these places where they maintain the genetic le legacies um, of our biodiverse resources are very, very important to us. So indigenous people are only four to 5% of the world population, but they live in places that contain the majority of the world's biodiverse resources, such as say the Amazon rainforest is one example of that. Um, and then traditional healing we know can be the key to medicine. Pharmaceuticals are actually sourced from biodiverse plants and animals. And so these gene banks, people that kind of take care of these traditional plants and animals and the jungles and the mountains and the hills and the deserts of our world, they are key to human and animal health. Sadly though, they are so neglected uh, for a lot of different reasons these days, uh, mostly industrial and corporate interests. Um, but pastoral lives, livestock, um, they are very, very important. So we're gonna talk a little bit about, about that and especially the camel. So that's so important because they uptake the nutrients that they need and that they're designed 
uh, to need from the environment that surrounds them and they produce food directly. So there's less harmful processing, things like cow lots and um, you know processing giant meat plants and things that damage the environment. And there's local sustainability, which also contributes to soil health. And while we won't talk about that tonight, that is actually kind of a, an important issue these days, soil health. Okay, where did my cursor go? There it is. Okay, so pastoralists and rangelands are important to the world. 54% of the world is rangelands per the Rangelands Atlas database. Uh, rangelands are home to many nomadic and pastoral livestock keepers. And these people are often underrated. People neglect them, ignore them, take them for granted. Uh, but they're out there and they're struggling these days. And um, we really need to recognize their importance. And I do see, since I've been doing this since 2005, I've been involved with camels and camel milk. And so I do see where previously people were never talking about uh, nomadic and pastoral livestock keepers. And now I've noticed, even though it's kind of coming from uh, more the um, international fringe areas outside of mainstream kind of talk, on, on the environment, it is growing bigger. So I do see that we're making progress and at least introducing these issues into the mainstream talk. And that needs to, of course, continue. So um, rangelands, um, these biodiverse resources, they can be exploited or they can experience desertification if they're not properly managed. Uh, luckily, there have been a few new efforts on uh, rangelands, atlases and mapping and things like that. Um, now, why do I care so much about these pastoralist traditions? And this is part of where the story comes in. Um, I care not only because now that I know about them, I think I care a lot about them and everybody should, but I care mainly in the beginning before I knew about them so much is because I was trying to help my son. Uh, my son had autism. And so I had done a lot of things to help him. I dropped my career uh, working in aerospace and the Pentagon and places like that. Uh, when my son was diagnosed with autism and I did a lot of things to help him. And then I wrote my first book, A Real Boy, which was mentioned during the introduction. And I learned then that if I took cow milk and other animal milks out of his diet and I lowered his sugar intake and I did other things to stabilize his immune function, he improved greatly in his symptoms of autism decreased. And so at that time, um, I had already done that. But then after my first book came out, I happened to be at a children's book festival in California and I saw a camel there and I really didn't know anything about camels at the time, but I went over and talked to the person that had that camel. He had Middle Eastern roots. That was one of the reasons why he was interested in camels because he had experience with them in another country. And after talking to him, I had the idea that the milk might help my son's autism symptoms because he said it was close to human breast milk and it may um, be non-allergenic and it was given to premature infants in hospitals in the Middle East. So that gave me an idea that it might help my son's autism symptoms and be a great uh, non-allergenic dairy substitute for people that cannot have other milks. So I had to struggle a lot and uh, the only place I could find camel milk was in the Middle East and I had to fly in frozen milk from the desert from those pastoral people. Um, and so my son was having a lot of problems due to autism, but at that time, no one knew about camel milk's health benefits for autism, but they did know that the camel milk was a healthy milk, the pastoralist people, nomadic people, but no one in the United States knew anything like that that I had ever heard of. And by the way, the picture is me after I flew in a lot of frozen milk um, into uh, Los Angeles airport. It had to travel very, very far. And so I thought you'd enjoy seeing that picture of what frozen milk looked like after it had traveled for about 25 hours. So after I got that milk in, this is my son. I gave him a half a cup of milk um, with cereal at bedtime. Um, that's four ounces. And so that's what about, um, you know, if you do milliliters, it's about 120 milliliters. So the next morning he was incredibly different. He had better speech, eye contact, emotion, and much more complex conversations. He said things like, I love you. You do so much for me. You're really great. You make my food, my, you make my medicine. Um, who's taking me to school? Who's picking me up? You know, all these great things he did and he ate more neatly and all these kind of things. So within three days, he could start crossing a parking lot alone and look both ways when he was crossing the street and these behavior breakdowns he had stopped. So things continued to be amazing with the camel milk. 
Uh, he was able to leave his ADHD school, go back to public school. His speech improved greatly and the milk worked systemically in his body. He had white bumps on his cheeks and they faded. They were behind his arms. And you'll see those in children with autism. Sometimes they'll have dark circles under their eyes. They'll have skin issues, however subtle, but we can see them once we know what we're looking for. And so when he would get foods that would cause him to quote, act autistic, such as milk powder and cow, and cow milk would have him sometimes hand flap and toe walk and walk in circles. And so um, when those things would happen, however rare, I would give him camel milk and within 15 minutes uh, that behavior would stop. So overall he had about a 30% improvement in autism symptoms. So um, at that time also, after a few years, I didn't have to fly in the camel milk anymore. I actually got it from uh, people in America and I gave it to my son and it worked the same way. So that was a very important point. My son was probably the first patient to ever take camel milk from two different uh, parts of the world. And so back then we kind of thought, um, well, maybe it's the, the breed, maybe it's the magic herbs they were eating in the desert. Maybe it's just you know something special about that camel uh, in the Middle East. But then my son showed that it was actually the camel itself that was kind of the delivery platform for the milk even though I had a very different diet over here in America. So that's when I wrote an article, my first article that went viral and it kicked off a new interest in camel milk across the world and it started inspiring the industry to grow. So then I was asked to write um, a, a medical journal article. So I wrote a case report describing everything about my son uh, reviewed by physicians and things like that is peer reviewed and it's now been cited about 14 times. So that got the interest of scientists. So we're going to see a film after I finish speaking, and we're gonna talk about uh, children and autism and camel milk and camels. So just as a quick little um, hint here, um, these are two children that we see them before and after they had camel milk. Uh, the child on the left here, um, he used to be kind of lost in his own world. And that's a phrase you'll often hear about children with autism. He was watching uh, Teletubbies here and just, um, you know, repetitive TV watching, that's a thing that's very common with these kids or on their iPads or phones. He was eating and, and got his headphones on and just in his own world. And then later after the camel milk, he became more engaged. He um, actually, his learning increased. He also, um, like here you can see him, he was jumping on a trampoline and you can see him smiling. You can see him looking at uh, his parents. You can see him actively engaged. The second one is very compelling, this little child right here. Uh, you will notice on his head, there are bruises from banging his head against the wall and the cabinets. And head banging is something that we see in autism. It can be very um, bad and it can be part of what they call self-injurious behavior. So this little child also, you can see that he has all kinds of inflammation and allergic response because of the, the, uh, the shiners, they call them allergy shiners under his eyes. You see how that pink and a dark inflammation around his eyes and uh, his lips are kind of puffy too. And look at that, no eye contact, totally glazed and remote. His improvement was amazing. Um, this child was breaking down like four to five times a day, smashing his head against cabinets, had a helmet on, to prevent the bruises. He couldn't learn anything. He couldn't talk. After he got camel milk, look, his skin cleared up. You can see him. He's got that social smile. He's looking, no more uh, bruises. And his language, quote, in the words of his mother, just exploded on camel milk. Um, so I think uh, we'll learn more. We'll see a little bit more of these in the, the film later. So um, we're going to try to move quickly because it's been a long um, the conference so far, but um, we'll just kind of speed through some things, but basically autism is rising globally and the need for a camel milk will increase. Um, it's very, very still a niche topic, but once people find out about it, then they're like, how come we don't use this more? Um, those things are because camels are on the outside of uh, mainstream society in some ways, but I'll talk about that in a minute. But this is current news. Uh, professor um, at the medical school in New Jersey, who's done a study, says it feels like science fiction to say that 7% of our eight year olds in one school district in New Jersey and 5% of eight year old boys statewide have autism. He says that's shocking, but in reality, this is true and it cannot be explained. 
Um, I do discuss some of the reasons why behind this in the book Camel Crazy, uh, usually it is uh, kind of corresponds to increasing industrialization, sometimes medical procedures, sometimes exposures to pesticide um, power plants, things like that, but we'll talk about that another time. Uh, but natural therapies are more attractive to parents of autistic children than medications. Um, a lot of children do end up on medications and a lot of adults do, but um, they really prefer natural therapies and camel milk is one. And of course we have other inflammation related disorders also rising in society, type, diabetes type one and two, ADD, uh, food allergies, gastrointestinal issues. And I have a whole list of these conditions and more in the book um, that explain uh, what conditions can camel milk work for and how much to use. So camels led me as just a regular American parent to a greater awareness of biodiversity. So I'm always grateful for that. Um, I started going all around the country. I went to the Middle East, I went to, uh, to India and I interviewed all these camel ears and uh, talked to all these traditional people. I introduced them to others. We built a network um, and we, I visited and reported on camels which are usually in remote locations. Here I'm on one, but that's in California and not too far from me. So, and then I wrote an article in India about that law that is really a problem. And I hope that someday we'll get that changed um, as you're probably aware of. Uh, in 2015, a law was passed that camels cannot be sold outside of Rajasthan, made it in the state animal, but that ended up backfiring. And uh, it's a real problem, but we hope it changes. Um, but now, of course, we have this global community, which is getting stronger every day that recognizes the value of camel milk. So while I'm writing and advising scientists, vets, doctors, farmers, parents, uh, uh, people like that, cultural and health communities, I visit farms and I... Uh, uh, deal with all countries, and I do science editing as well. Um, I'm just happy to report that the camel milk is really helping a lot of people. Uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of families are using it now, and some adults with autism and adults with other medical conditions. One of the great things about camel milk in the autism community is it brings out the fathers. Um, it's hard for fathers to really get involved in autism. Sometimes it's very, it hurts their pride a lot. It's very hard for them to even accept the child has a problem, let alone autism, but they like camel milk. It feels like something to just reach out easily and just do. And so that's a very positive thing. So the milk brings um, the camel community into contact with people outside the camel community and it helps lift awareness of camels. And female veterinarians and all veterinarians, but female veterinarians in particular in the beginning were really at the forefront of this camel milk and pastoralist movement. This is Dr. Ilsa Kola Rolofsson. She is in India. She is with LPPS and of course the Camel Charisma Dairy. She's a total expert on what's going on. So I would suggest that you get in touch with her um, if you have any questions about things that she says you can do to lift the dairy industry. So, these things are outside the mainstream still, even though they're really starting to penetrate into the health community. So why are pastoralist products and knowledge outside the mainstream? Well, traditional livestock knowledge is held by rural cultures and they usually have low visibility. And today's world doesn't value the, this traditional knowledge like, in my opinion, it should. Um, sure, there are things like old wives tales and things like that, but there's also a great deal of knowledge that is very relevant to us that just gets lost because it's not peer reviewed, produced in a lab, you know, funded by a grant, things like that. So pastoralists are often on the move and they're not connected to settled areas. They can also be very conservative in insular societies, such as we've seen uh, the Rika in India, and then in our own country in America, the Amish people, they are a very conservative religious group, but they actually are some of our best camel milkers these days. So uh, products are now emerging and they're becoming more and more kind of fancy packaged and marketed on Instagram and things like that. Uh, when I first uh, started, uh, you saw products like the picture you see here. This is when I vis visited an Amish farm in Pennsylvania. So you have uh, your bottle of camel milk and the red cap. Then you have CY for camel yogurt. You have CK for camel kefir, which is fermented. And so of course um, could have some of that increased value that we heard about earlier. Um, and then of course you have your camel soap and lotions are out there, but um, I didn't see any Amish people producing lotion. So these, uh, these pastoralists sometimes face steep odds of survival. They are literally clinging to their animals and their survivability right now. So we need to increase their value to market society and preserve their land access. 
So one example of how this is happening on a global scale is this is very exciting for us camel people. Uh, 2024 has been declared the International Year of Camelids. And so that includes the whole camel genetic family. Um, so the UN wants to raise public awareness of them for food security, ecosystems, all those things we talked about, the consumption of goods to help um, eradicate hunger and keep these communities afloat. And the International Camel Organization of Saudi Arabia, that's called ICO, they're also um, kind of ramping up lately and they have um, been part of helping here in America, us form uh, an organization called Necroa, which is a uh, North American Camel Ranch Owners Association. So we're starting to kind of get a little more organized here too. Then there's also World Milk Day, World Donkey Day and World Camel Day and other opportunities to raise biodiversity awareness. So some of these ways, as we saw a little bit earlier in the other presentation, um, which I'll keep simple here, uh, science, human health, food, entertainment, textiles, and crafts. Um, there I am in Dubai looking at um, some camel um, embryo development being put into artificial insemination being put into the camel. Um, and then to the right is our India's very own Magan Raika, who um, really does his best to work with camels every day. Uh, sometimes he has to take other jobs on, but he would prefer to be uh, in his village in Sadri uh, working with his beloved camels. And I would prefer they be there too, serving the rest of us with their wonderful milk and sustaining their valuable lifestyle, which they really cherish. So camel milk is a small but growing health foods industry. Uh, it's a potential $10.2 billion industry over the next 10 years, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nation. Uh, they're the second fastest growing herbivorous livestock animal. Demand is rising mainly due to autism and other health consumers, plus the Muslim meat and milk market. Most governments still don't really support anything to do with camels, but luckily we have a few exceptions to that. Um, and we would like to see more, of course. Um, when I first started this in 2005, I began when I first had my idea. And then later, there were only a few world camel dairies and then little tiny ones here and there. Now we're having a lot more around the world. Pakistan is growing with their camel market. Malaysia is growing, like all these places. Um, and so th 3 million tons of camel milk was officially sold, um, but 70% of camel milk is consumed by the owners and never reaches the market. Um, and when I'm talking about Malaysia, I'm thinking one of the kind of problems of success is that fake and adulterated milk is starting to appear. So Malaysia, be a little careful because some of the products we're seeing there um, may be mixed with other milk, which we don't want as a health consumer because you've already heard that camel, that cow milk and other milks like that are not good for people with autism. Um, not all, but a, a great many people with autism don't do well on them. Saudi Arabia is a top market um, and more studies are emerging. And so to the right, that was a camel milking competition in Dubai I attended. And uh, so they demonstrate the scientific value of biodiversity camels do. They are unique. They have special properties. I discuss all of that in my book, Camel Crazy, but uh, for today's purposes, they're very unique. They have oval blood cells, which can squeeze down and dehydrate. We're in the, those hot environments in the desert. And then they can rehydrate very, very quickly, uh, swelling to many times their size as they refill with water when the camel drinks again. And that kind of thing could kill a normal animal. But at, camels are designed to be able to live like that and survive. Of course, they have an amazing um, uh, antibodies and immunoglobulins and their um, IgGs re resist pathogens. And uh, they're kind of like the shark in that they only have heavy chain antibodies, not light and heavy like most species. And so um, they are being used for a lot of different things. They're a platform for vaccines and immunotherapy, antiviral therapy. And it looks like now um, they're coming up with ways to neutralize the uh, beta coronaviruses. So one new study is that MERS exposed camels um, may have possible application to COVID therapy use. Oh, and by the way, the graphic to the right is when my book came out, uh, there's a geneticist. Um, she actually reviewed the book and she, can, she wanted to know what are the gene genetics in the camel that make the milk uh, effective for autism. And she went back and did that genetic tracing on the camel and wrote an article about it. So um, it's pretty fantastic. 
So uh, we'll skip over this uh, in the interest of time, but basically um, we've seen lately that camel lids, you know, were so important and camels being one of them, but for this particular application, a drop of blood was taken from a llama. Um, a few of them, uh, the, the antibodies were shown to uh, bind weakly to the virus and that of course virus being the coronavirus. Uh, the research team engineered those weakly binding antibodies and they created new nanobodies that bind very tightly and they bind to the coronavirus spike and they block it. So we're, the, the people that did this research are hoping that those nanobodies can be made into an aerosol and inhaled. So that like, say you get up in the morning, you inhale your uh, protective, um, you know, inhalant, um, your nanobodies, and then you go out and, the, and you can't uh, get COVID, like that would be great, right? They're looking for funding. So let's hope that they get it. So as we know from the other presentation, but also I talk about this regularly, uh, these traditional foods, not just camel milk, but a lot of these kind of foods could be functional or therapeutic medicine foods. So um, we've already looked at some of those in uh, our, my colleague's prior presentation, but basically uh, they can positively impact gut bacteria, which we now know is linked to brain health. We've known this in the autism world for a while, but they're way behind us, but they're always adapting what we start out with. So um, one of those is the gut brain, um, back, the, the gut brain connection and how uh, bacteria in your microbiome can actually affect your brain health and your functioning. And aging well is one of those as well. And thanks to Dr. Ilsa, uh, we know that 80% of camel milk from India's Camel Charisma, which is her um, operation, is sold to the parents of autistic children. And then some of it lately has been used for tuberculosis patients as well. And these uh, camels feed on 36 Ayurvedic plants, which uh, are thought to really enhance that, uh, that milk. And I've tried that milk myself and it's fantastic. So um, I'm just glad that 80% of the milk is going to the families that I care deeply about. Okay, so, and here's a new uh, report that I'm giving. Um, I haven't published it or anything, but I'm putting it here. So this is a new diabetes patient report. This is Rena Solomon. She lives in California, fairly close to me. She's well known as the angel in a Hummer because she goes and helps rescue people in disasters in her big Hummer vehicle. So she was diagnosed with type two diabetes and she was put on these drugs, metformin, trulicity, and then insulin. The trulicity made her feel very sick. So she thought, I'll try camel milk. So she tried the frozen, but it didn't help enough. She actually went and bought camels so she could try the fresh raw milk. She took 16 ounces a day for six months. She was able to stop her insulin and stop the trulicity. And her A1C dropped to 5.5 on camel milk and metformin. Um, and her blood sugar drops under 100 after she gets fresh camel milk. And the pain in her hands also stopped. And that's kind of a clue that she may have a little bit more inflammation going on through her body, perhaps some kind of rheumatoid, uh, rheumatoid type effect. Um, but she really needs that fresh raw camel milk. And I've been to her farm and she's trying to increase her camels there. Um, so one of the other ways we can increase the value of pastoralists and nomadic people um, to uh, the market out in that larger world is through traditional fabrics and handicrafts. So here's uh, Netha Raika, who is a camelier from um, India. He is kind of outside of Jodhpur in his village. Um, he's holding these beautiful camel blankets that the women, uh, that he says the older women um, make these and it's a lost art and they're still sewing these and there's a slit in the middle to go across the camel's hump. And they're very uh, valuable, beautiful, but he says they need younger women or younger people to learn how to do that. So that's a struggle they're facing. So I hope we can keep that beautiful handiwork going. And then you see other things like this. And then of course, I bought myself some sheep scarves from uh, uh, Bickener. Uh, so this is a great store. Um, Ashok had a, a store um, at your very own Camel Research Center. Unfortunately, he had to shut down during COVID, but he's up and running again. And I love these scarves and you can order them dyed uh, in the colors that you want at a very reasonable price and the shipping was easy. So I'm uh, thinking that if he can keep going with this and develop camel products as to camel, um, camel hair products as he is, um, that, that we can go somewhere with this uh, if we can support businesses like his. So as uh, my colleagues talked about, entertainment is one way, racing, fairs, festivals, milking contests, tourism, rides, treks, time with animals. 
people are starved for time with animals and they don't even know it. So a lot of people don't have never been around a large animal like a camel, a horse, a cow, things like that. And I've seen out here, there's a, a farm near me that has a program called Hands-On Camels and suburban women from the, just the houses around, you know, in these nice houses where they uh, don't have like farms or anything, they pay good money to come out spend time with the camels, brush them, comb them, lead them around, ride them. So that's one possibility. Um, and also this is a, a trek in Texas uh, from someone that I know. So of course, uh, we believe probably here in this audience that this nomadic and pastoral wisdom is valuable and worth saving, but it's a tough mission to get outside people to pay any attention to nomadic or pastoral people. I have done close to 200 media and events since my book came out, and I'm always talking about nomadic and pastoral people. I don't get many questions about them per se, but I bring them up because I want people to know about them. So I'm glad to see that people are talking about them more. We have to remember that livestock has been the backbone of society and camels and cattle have formed the wealth status and trading abilities of many cultures and their lifestyles can benefit us all. And they're not destructive on the landscape as much as people think they are when they are properly managed. They're actually beneficial. So here is the Lahawin tribe on the move after the rainy season in Sudan. And you can see the little house on top of the camel is for women and children to ride along. So Sudanese camels who graze on rich natural pasture have improved omega-3s in their milk and they offer human health benefits uh, per a recent study. And animal soil interaction and droppings can improve the habitat of smaller species by spreading seed, spreading uh, fertilizer, uh, probably distributing the microbiome of these animals to interact with the soil. Um, these are the things that we need to keep up, even though it's becoming a struggle. So in my country, we have Amish people. Um, they're the traditional religious folks, and they kind of similar to pastoralists in other countries in some ways, because they like to live away from the culture. They have their own strong value system, and they love to live off animals in the farm when they can. And so this is one of our best uh, American farmers um, his name is uh, Marlon Troyer and Savannah Troyer, and they're, they have a lot of camels now, and uh, they have terrific milk. And then, of course, this is uh, my friend Sidi Amar. He's a Tuareg from Niger, and he came here years ago. He trains camels here. He's lived here for many years. He's a very intelligent man. He's in exemplifies the great traits of nomadic life. He can sleep anywhere. He can adjust to any group of people, and he understands animals just by looking in their their eye or their crook of their neck or things like that. He just can read them like no one. And he says, if I knew then what I know now, I would be a nomad back home raising my camels. Everyone can benefit from pastoralist ways. Uh, societies are healthier when you have outdoor interaction. Uh, there's a thing called forest bathing that actually shows the benefits to, to humans uh, in a study when you're just going out and spending time in the forest. Uh, it increases our immune function, and I believe teaching children to be comfortable with nature by planting, touching raw foods, uh, dirt and soil, getting away from the Wi-Fi and the computers, it's better for them, it's better for their vision, it's better for their microbiome, it's better for their allergic response, and I think it's good for their personality to learn to engage with the real things around us and not just have everything so clean and based on online stuff. So, and I believe this also increases their skills and their self-sufficiency. And engaging with people from other ways of life will strengthen our world and help create courtesy and respect. And we need to schedule these opportunities for ourselves and our families, otherwise they're not gonna happen. So, um, as I said, the forest bathing increases the human killer cells. It has documented anti-cancer and calming effects in males and females. And one session lasted uh, seven days in the study. Um, nomadic children had better health than settled children in one northern Kenya study. And um, this fine fellow here that we're seeing is uh, Salad Samatir. He is a Somali elder. He lives in San Diego. And I feature him and other Somali seniors in the Camel Crazy book. I've spent time with them. These gentlemen and older women said they had never seen children in their country who could not le learn or sit still or listen. That means they did not see disabilities. I mean, I asked them. They didn't see people who fit the mold of disabilities there as far as, you know, the, the uh, intellectual disabilities like we see with autism, ADHD, things like that. 
Um, they retain the wisdom of a pastoral way of life. And to me, they constitute a human genetic legacy. If we as a society could utilize their knowledge and uh, you know, kind of create a value to it and have people emulate it by living in the forest or the jungles on camel milk, such as the way these guys grew up, they would go out and graze with their camels for a whole year and live off of camel milk. And they're still so strong. They feel it benefited them tremendously. If we could do that and at least offer little sessions of that, maybe not a whole year in the jungle, but a little session of that for people and monetize that, then people could benefit in a lot of different ways. So we know pastoralists need help. Um, it's a tough scene out there, especially in India. The good part is they're rising everywhere. Camel's interest is rising almost everywhere while they're dropping precipitously in India. My colleague discussed that, so I won't go into that. Um, but you know, this loss of grazing access also increases their illness. It weakens them and mange and other diseases like that increase. And um, the milk reg regulations can be burdensome on these kind of people. And now we also need to give them a COVID uh, outreach and vaccines and support and things like that. So I received these today, um, the camel milk uh, company, um, Advic Foods in India, who I have had their products uh, several times for uh, over a few years now. I've had their chocolate, I've had their different um, uh, milk, and um, they made these nice posters, uh, support camels on this camel day. And they talk about the population, how quickly they've dropped. And I think it's nice to see that a simple graphic like this with a little bit of information on it, these are the kind of things that I'd like to see on billboards, on um, magazines, uh, you know, if you're having a festival, maybe put out some flyers or put it up on a screen, stuff like that would be wonderful. And don't forget, of course, since you're all, a lot of you are university students and are studying biology and life sciences and things like that, I figured you should be um, encouraged to know that the, the veterinary care for camels, uh, the need for that is on the rise. So in America, we're definitely having some more need for camel care, but in India, we still need camel care. It's gonna to be tough when the population is dropping, but if we can keep the dairy industry stronger, then of course, maybe there'll be a career path in treating camels in India as well. So we know they need peace and development. Uh, this is a Somali camel uh, with the uh, politicians of the country to the right. They have a symbolic camel, it's so important to them. And uh, to the lower right, we see um, the uh, Marwar Camel Festival in India, and there's Dr. Ilsa and uh, some other folks, one I see from the Bikiner Research Center, I think on the left. Um, these are things we need to remember. Livestock can bring parts of society together. As we see in uh, the milk, it's bringing the autism community and parents out from the cities, literally, to come and learn about camels and get milk. Um, the market value of camels could theoretically create allies in some of these troubled areas. Like I'm talking about in Africa right now, when the, when the pastoralists and the herders come through certain villages or certain areas, there's often clashes or sometimes they can fight with each other. So if you use mediation um, and some technologies such as tracking uh, pastoralists and tracking things like that um, and giving information on you know who's who's in what area at what time it can help some of those uh, disputes which can be very deadly um, and they're often characterized as religious violence but really they're often about you know tribal and uh, grazing uh, disputes and as my colleague said earlier camels take less feed and water good for the climate um, I personally from where I come from I think it's really important that we keep the opportunity to cross borders and cross cultures to help children and sick people. I would love to see creating safe zones for camels all around the world. I know it's a pipe dream, but I think it would be fantastic because the camel has great symbology among Muslim cultures. They know that it's very special. It's mentioned in the Quran. Um, they have a reverence for it. Um, I feel like uh, the camel is a great vehicle for creating more peace and awareness. Um, and I'd like people to remember the nomadic tradition of giving it to the sick for free. In many countries, the camel milk was given to sick people for free as a good deed. And that also crosses a, often, often religions. Um, and so I would like to see uh, government supporting um, these families by giving away the milk and, or at least underwriting it and making it affordable. Um, I'd like to see more early stage science funding for pastoral resources. And then, for example, Dr. Ilsa at EPS, um, at LPPS, she has a new mapping project for pastoralists, so get in touch with her if you want to see that. 
Uh, Mongolia, this has a great example of what they're doing in rangelands. Um, they have very wide intact rangelands and they have a great variety of livestock. To the right, you can see yak, cattle, camels, and they have the two hump uh, Bactrian camels, uh, which are great dairy, uh, dairy resources. They have horses, sheep, goat, reindeer, um, so they have been working on this for a while. They have a project called Green Gold, and they have worked on fashion, textiles, products for the international market. They now have identified 21 herder groups and a code of practices, and they have a tracking system called Responsible Nomads. So it standardizes the steps on how to sustain what they're doing, and they have a rangelands database mapping site, and that helps protect wildlife habitats and rare plants when they're incentivized and tracked and shared so they know what they're doing and what they should do, um, it helps them live responsibly. And going back to our earlier, uh, when we opened this presentation, talking about how people can damage the environment um, if they don't have an alternative to making it valuable, this is the, what we're doing, you know, well, I'm not doing it, but this is what they're doing uh, to make it valuable. Um, to the people that are living there. And this is increasing household and female income. And that whole um, issue about getting female income rising uh, due to dairy products, that is kind of common in camel cultures. Oftentimes in these camel cultures, the females manage uh, the livestock and manage the camels and the milk goes, money goes to them and they can use it for things that are important to women and then also especially education of girls. So just to kind of start to wrap up, um, in my very own neck of the woods, uh, we have camels on farms here, but not very many, uh, but we do have wildlife and this is a suburban biodiversity example. Uh, we have a lot of freeways and highways here. And so it cuts off those uh, habitats, cuts them in pieces, um, makes it hard for wildlife to go from one to the other. And so um, when you just have these smaller habitats, it creates a monoculture and diseases can spread easily there and fertility problems and birth defects in the wildlife. So um, this is the big 17 lane highway and there's a big dark tunnel underneath it and it gets blocked up and the animals hate to cross it. And we have bobcats here and we have uh, coyotes and things like that. So um, they're gonna modify this. So they're gonna put night lighting and they're gonna put logs and rocks for shelter and it's gonna connect two wildlife reservoirs that are cut off. And so this goal of connectivity that we have um, will let mountain lions and bobcats and other animals travel safely through there. And it will create a new bobcat generation every five years if we're successful. And mountain lions, they're seen south of me in some of the more um, less chopped up kind of parts of my county, which is Orange County, California. Um, but they haven't been seen right around here in about 20 years, but they do feel that this will help um, the mountain lions return. So the next generation needs exposure to this great uh, information about camels and biodiversity. So here in America, we have one of our great supporters um, of the camel movement. Uh, Debbie is her name and she has Truman the camel and she takes Truman out to meet children and to teach them about camels. And of course the camel on the right is wearing um, one of the, uh, the um, camel blankets from Rajasthan, which we got from uh, some of the people that sell them there. And um, so the children are delighted by it. The adults learn some things. And um, then this was used to raise money. She and I actually uh, were raising money for um, a child with autism who is also deaf in Pakistan. And so this helped us raise money and we were able to give that money to uh, the child so she can get testing and perhaps hearing aids. So things are getting a little better uh, since I began in 2005. Now thousands of families across the world are using camel milk. The research is continuing. New companies are distributing it in many countries. And my dream of universal access to camel milk is slowly coming true. We have a ways to go, but we're doing much better. And uh, that's me on the right. The first time I ever saw camel milk for sale in the United States in a grocery store, instead of me having to fly it in from other countries or. Uh, get it from a farm. And that was in San Francisco. So that was quite the happy day. Um, and here I am on the left with uh, an esteemed scientist in uh, Egypt. She's in Egypt. Uh, she's from Egypt. We were in Berlin speaking uh, at a keynote uh, event that I was doing with uh, Dr. TK Galat, your very own uh, famous camel scientist and surgeon. And I might uh, remind you that you have the greatest repository of camel research and literature coming out of there. He publishes a wonderful um, journal that he has for many years. 
And in the middle, there is a recent article um, that we did in Kenya for World Milk Day. That's another one of those great times you can promote camel milk. And then there's a, an article featuring uh, the things I'm talking about in um, the Rajasthan Patrika. So the book is uh, the book that I wrote is pretty new. Um, it describes the entire journey. It describes all about camels. It features the pastoralists, the people, the milk sellers that I'm talking about, it explains all about camels, but it's all in a fun story and has pictures and it has four chapters set in India too. Um, and so my goal was to really share uh, the story of the pastoralists, the nomads, and give them their own voice and their own words. And then of course, share why camel milk is so important and how it really changed our lives and saved our, my son's life in a lot of different ways. And then also in the very back, uh, it has a user's guide. How much do I give for what disease condition? How long do I give it? Does it have to be pasteurized, raw, frozen? How do I get my child to take it? How do I prepare? And a global list of sellers. So anybody that wants to know about camel milk is going to find pretty much what they need in there. And then chapter 15 is a science section. For those of you who want to know about all the qualities in camel milk, why it works the way it does, that's, uh, it's all going to be there for you. So let's keep this talk going. You can, of course, can order Camel Crazy from any bookstore or online. The Hump Group in the UK sells it and Advocate Foods in India actually carries the book. And then of course, I hope you'll take a picture and follow me on social media so I can look at what you're doing as well. I really appreciate that. So that's the end of the presentation. And then we're gonna move on into sharing um, one little short video clip. And then we'll talk about, we'll, we'll share the, um, the actual um, film that we're going to show, which isn't that long, so stay with us. <laughs> 